Now, I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes, half an hour, and I think it's quite important that I'm not just talking and you're just listening. I want you to ask questions as well, because these are, on one level, complex things, on, other, on, level, on another level, simple things, these, these pieces of paper, these Leonardo drawings. But I'm very familiar with them. I've been working with them for about 25 years now. And there are probably some elements of them that I take a bit for granted that other people may not take for granted, may not quite understand. So if I'm saying something that makes no sense at all, please just stick your hand up or shout out or something, because I, I do want you to have an opportunity to ask me lots of questions as we go through the afternoon. I'm going to start here with a picture of Windsor Castle, um, which is where the drawings are normally housed. The drawings have been in the Royal Collection for over 300 years, and they moved to Windsor Castle in about 1835, during the reign of William IV. So they've been at Windsor for about 180 years now. And they're housed in the print room. Now, it's a bit of a misleading name because it's called the print room, but what's mean in it is drawings. There are some prints as well, but we have about 35,000 drawings in the Royal Collection. About half of those are old master drawings, the other half 19th, 20th century works. We have about 100,000 prints. Um, but the drawings are what we're famous for, and it's a very unusual collection. It's a very lumpy collection. It's not a collection that's been put together over the last two centuries by professional curators who've been assembling a representative survey of European art. So whereas at the British Museum, the curators there have tried to buy everything to show all aspects of Western draftsmanship. We've never done that. For a start, nothing has been acquired, no old masters have been acquired since about 1770. So the collection is more than 250 years old in its present form. And the drawings have been acquired by just two monarchs. Charles II, who in the 17th century bought the Renaissance drawings, and George III, who in the 18th century bought the Baroque drawings. And so apart from those two bursts of acquisition, there's been very little buying of old master drawings. So what was bought was just what was available at the time. There's never been a professional curator who's been trying to buy things. Simply a king, or in this case two kings, have said, I fancy some drawings, and sent their agents out across Europe, and those agents have bought things, and they've entered the royal collection. And Charles II was fortunate enough to be buying at a time when you could acquire hundreds of drawings by a single artist in one go. Nowadays, if you want to buy an old master drawing, you go along to Christie's or Sotheby's, you bid 30 million pounds and you get one Raphael for it, and that's your one piece of paper. And they come to market very, very rarely. In the 17th, 18th centuries, there were large groups of drawings that were still intact from artist studios. An artist would die, their studio properties would pass on to their heirs, sometimes they'd be sold on block to a collector. The collector would put them into portfolios or mount them on the pages of albums. And so hundreds and hundreds of drawings by individual artists would stay together as a group. And if you were acquiring drawings, if you were collecting drawings in the 17th century, that's what you tended to buy, a whole group of drawings by one artist. Now, sometimes in later centuries, they could be split up and the drawings sold off, whole meal, sold off whole meal, um, piecemeal. rather. But because the Royal Collection has always stayed together, we do still have these large groups of drawings by individual artists, and that's what we have with Leonardo. So this one album that you see on the screen there um, is empty now. You can see on the right what it looks like in its present state, which is just blank sheets and occasionally some sheets with, with holes cut in them where a double-sided drawing had been mounted. But that is the album that Charles II acquired somehow, we don't know how, we don't know how much he paid for it, but at some point in the third quarter of the 17th century, Charles II acquired this album, which is stamped in gold on the front, Disegni di Leonardo da Vinci, Restaurati da Pompeo Leone, drawings by Leonardo da Vinci, um, Restored, which really means looked after, kept together by Pompeo Leone. Now, Pompeo Leone was a sculptor. He was sculptor to the King of Spain. And he bought these drawings from Leonardo's heir, Francesco Melzi. So in four easy leaps, you go from Leonardo, who at his death in 1519 in France, bequeathed all his drawings to his favorite pupil, Francesco Melzi. 
Melzi took them back to Milan. On his death, they were sold to Pompeo Leone, who put them into this album, and then Charles II acquired that. And that's why all these drawings, more than 500 drawings by Leonardo, are still together as a group in the Royal Collection. That's why we've got this big group. So often the first question I'm asked is, how much did the Queen pay for them? The Queen didn't pay anything for them. She simply inherited them, and they've been in the collection as a group of more than 500 drawings since the 17th century. That early provenance also explains why they're in such fantastic condition, because they've not been on the open market, they've not been mounted and unmounted and hung in frames in the light and copied and so on. They've been kept together mainly on the pages of this album since, uh, since the late 16th century. And because they've been so well looked after, in many cases they're as fresh as the day that Leonardo drew them. And that's a real help for interpreting these drawings, because one of the things that people find quite difficult about old master art is that it looks old, it's a bit intimidating, it's often suffered quite badly from the centuries, and it's a little bit hard to see what's going on. But in the case of the Leonardo drawings, they're in fantastic condition. You can see exactly what Leonardo intended to draw, and people who've never set foot in an art gallery before find these Leonardo drawings really easy to come to terms with. Now, I'm going to talk a little, sorry, I'm going to stop now and say any questions at this stage before I talk about the individual drawings. One here. I'm just thinking with children, if we show them that picture, they don't want to know who cut out the picture. Right, they were taken out of the album um, mostly in the late 19th century because they were unprotected on the pages of this album. And as the pages turned, the drawing. Sorry, the drawings would rub across each other, something like that, and the chalk drawings were, were offsetting. So, for their own safety, they were taken out of the album and placed in what's called sunk mount. So, the drawings on a backboard, and there's a, a window put in a top board over the top of it, and that's how you see the drawings today. Not in their 19th century mounts, in late 20th century mounts. They're now encapsulated between two sheets of ultraviolet filtered one millimeter thick perspex in mounts which are double-sided so you can see the front and the back, the recto and the verso of the drawings. And that's the, those mounts are the permanent mounts and they live in boxes, if I go back to that. The boxes that you see there around the walls, those are the boxes that house um, 10 or 12 or sometimes 50 to a box mounted drawings. So the frames that you'll see them in in the exhibition are temporary exhibition frames. They're not the permanent frames. They don't normally live in the frames. They're not normally hung in the light, because as you know, if you leave a newspaper on a window ledge, it goes yellow after a couple of days. The paper that Leonardo drew on was handmade rag paper. It's the equivalent of the best quality artist's paper that you can acquire today. So it's a lot more hard wearing than newsprint. But nonetheless, if you hang drawings in the light permanently, they will fade, they will discolor, and that's why we can't do it with the Leonardo's. They're only on display in temporary exhibitions, such as the one that's coming here in a month's time. So they were taken out of that album by Queen Victoria's librarians in the late 19th century and mounted individually. The great advantage of mounting them individually, of course, as well, is that you can exhibit them, whereas if they're on the pages of an album, you can only display one opening at a time. And that period in the late 19th century was when drawing started to be put in art exhibitions, whereas before then it was mainly just paintings, but people started getting interested in the exhibition of drawings of that time. It's a rather long answer to a simple question. And anything else at this stage? One here. We have, and the very first drawing I'm going to talk about is a silver point. They are? I'll, I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Bear with me. Anything else? Without further ado, let's go on to the silver point drawing, because clearly there's an appetite. I'm, I'm delighted that people know about silver point drawing already. Um, Leonardo drew in just a few basic media during his life. His favored medium throughout his life was pen and ink, and pen was a goose's wing feather cut with a pen knife to a point, and dipped into ink that was made from oak apples, oak galls, and a solution of iron salts. And you get something called iron gall ink from that, and you dip your goose's feather into that. And what we will have in the exhibition, I hope, I think, we're having the, the, the video in the exhibition? Does anyone, we are, yes. Uh, is a video made by our conservator. You can see it on YouTube now. 
Um, <coughs> which is only five minutes long, and it shows how Leonardo prepared and used his materials. And we put this onto the Royal Collection's uh, Facebook page on the anniversary of Leonardo's birth on the 15th of April this year, and said, Happy birthday, Leonardo. Um, you might like to have a look at a video showing how he made his materials. And in the first weekend, this video had been seen by a quarter of a million people. It's now been seen by more than two million people. So there's a real appetite for Leonardo's use of materials. And you can see Alan preparing a goose's wing feather, baking it in sand to make it hard, cutting it with a knife, dipping it in ink and so on. You can see exactly how Leonardo did his drawings. So pen and ink is used throughout Leonardo's life. Metal point, which is something a little more obscure, he used only in the first half of his career. Now, metal point is drawing with a metal stylus, usually of silver, so it's often called silver point, as just now, um, on paper that's been prepared with a coating of ground bone. So you grind the bone to a fine powder, um, and that's slightly abrasive. Um, it's, uh, you, you bind it with some dilute glue, uh, brush it onto the surface of the paper. When it's dry, you can burnish it to a smooth surface. And when the metal point is drawn across that, it leaves a deposit of the metal, which tarnishes and gives the trace. Now, here, on the left of the drawing, is just the metal point, but it is often quite a delicate trace. And so often Leonardo will fix it. Actually, I've got a point here. It doesn't work on that screen. Uh, it, 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 uh, Leonardo would fix the outlines with pen and ink, and that's what he's done at the top right of the sheet. So this drawing is a combination of metal point and pen and ink. Sometimes the metal point fades. Now, what I described, grinding the metal point and brushing it on the surface and leaving it to dry, it's a very laborious process. It's something which takes a couple of hours to grind the, the bone to a sufficiently fine powder. It takes time for it to dry on the paper. Usually it's the sort of thing you would get the workshop assistants to do, but it is quite time consuming. So Leonardo tended to use this technique only for careful drawings from the life when he wanted to capture the fall of light on, uh, on, a, on a living surface. And that's why these drawings of an infant's limb were done in metal point. Now, people sometimes say to me, this appears to be a very fat child. And that's a good thing, because if you're in the 15th century, a fat child was a healthy child. And that's why children in uh, paintings of the Madonna and Child and so on in the 15th century are usually very fat babies, because he wanted to have a fat baby. This was a good thing to have. Now, this drawing is in metal point. Uh, sorry, that drawing was in metal point. This drawing is in pen and ink, which I described earlier. And it's a, a double-sided sheet, and we're displaying both sides of the sheet in the exhibition. Whereas the first drawing was a study probably for a painting, uh, where Leonardo is trying to capture the arrangement of a baby's limbs so that he can devise a composition of the Madonna and Child and then paint that composition. This is rather different. This is a, a sheet of technical studies for the casting of a huge equestrian bronze, uh, a monument to Francesco Sforza, the former ruler of Milan, the former Duke of Milan, and the deceased father of, his then, of Leonardo's then employer, Ludovica Sforza, who was the ruler of Milan and was Leonardo's employer around 1490. Now, Ludovica wanted to commission a monument to his dead father to emphasize the legitimacy of the Sforza rule in Milan. Uh, Francesco had been something of a usurper. He was a, a military leader, a mercenary leader, who, when the previous duke had died without a male heir, uh, Francesco had sort of stepped in, married uh, Gian, uh, uh, the Visconti daughter, and so he sort of took over, though he wasn't a legitimate heir. So to cement the Sforza rule in Milan, Ludovica Sforza commissioned this huge monument to his father. It was to be three times life size, we think. So the horse alone standing probably something like the height of this gallery. An impossible commission. Nothing like it had ever been cast in Europe since antiquity. And Leonardo probably wasn't going to be able to carry this out. But nonetheless, he gave it his best shot. And what we see on this drawing is a sequence of studies of the apparatus to cast the bronze. Because when you're casting something that size, you can't make a mold above ground 
it would just collapse under its own weight. So what Leonardo did was to prepare a mould that would be buried underground in a pit, and the bronze would have been melted and would have been poured through runners into the mould. I'm going to have to walk over here now. So what you're seeing here are a, a schematic version of the runners that the bronze would have been poured down to fill the empty mould underground. Then it would have been left for several days for the bronze to cool down and solidify. But then you have to get the whole thing, this enormous weight, probably 50 tonnes or something like that, not just the bronze but the mould itself, out of the ground. And how Leonardo solved that problem, actually, I'm going to walk around here and point it. This is a schematic of the horse underground cutting cross-section so it's like a cylinder, but it's legs poking in the air, and that's a cross-section of the neck. You can see it again a little bit larger there. And this is, if you like, the whole mould. And so he devised this enormous pulley system. These are pulleys with a rope going up and down, up and down, up and down. And then a sort of ratchet gearing, whatever, to, to slowly haul the whole thing out of the ground. Um, I think Leonardo was terrified of the prospect of actually casting it because, as I say, no one had ever cast anything like this before in Europe. He'd worked with Andrea del Verrocchio, who was the greatest bronze caster in 15th century Italy, but Leonardo had never done anything like this. And I almost get a sense in drawings and sketches and notes like this that he's slightly trying to put off the moment at which he's actually going to have to do it. And so he's constantly thinking and making sketches and explaining to himself how he's going to go about doing it. So this is a, a typical example of Leonardo thinking aloud on paper. And I suppose all the drawings in the exhibition are Leonardo thinking on paper. Now most of the notes on the left-hand sheet, the recto of this, are in Leonardo's typical mirror writing. He was left-handed, he wrote all his personal notes throughout his life in perfect mirror image, starting at the right of the sheet and working to the left. And if you look at it in a mirror, it's just normal writing. Now, there have been various suggestions as to why he did this. People say, oh, he was trying to keep his research a secret. This is the Da Vinci Code. Actually, it's probably just because he was left-handed and he found it easier to write because he wasn't smudging his uh, his wet ink that way. Now that's a very logical explanation, but there'd be many left-handed people. I dare say a fifth of the people in this room are left-handed. But you probably don't write in perfect mirror image. So it's just one of Leonardo's little oddities that you kind of get used to. Um, but people are intrigued by this. Um, <coughs> this drawing shows Leonardo writing in the conventional direction because it was a drawing uniquely in this exhibition, and very rarely for Leonardo, a drawing done for other people to see. Uh, it was a map that was commissioned by the Florentine government as a survey of a stretch of the river Arno just to the east of the city. Now the Arno, as you probably know from the floods in Florence in 1966, is a mountain torrent. It's subject to flooding in the spring thaw and the autumn rains. And in those days, before it was properly embanked, the banks needed regular maintenance. And what Leonardo has drawn here is a section where the water has flowed through a weir and has hit the bank and has caused it to crumble. And Leonardo has written twice on it. Uh, here, I'm going to point again. Here the breakage is 60 braccia, that's about 120 feet wide, and 6 braccia, about 12 feet deep. And then you can see the current is sort of refracted through the, um, through the Arno and hits the bank again about 200 meters further down the river. Here the breakage is 200 feet wide. And people think that Leonardo was this ivory tower figure, just sort of sitting in his studio coming up with crazy ideas for flying machines and submarines and so on. But he was also a very practical chap. And the people who employed Leonardo, for about two-thirds of his career, he was a salaried artist, not somebody who was producing paintings on commission. He was paid a retainer for about two-thirds of his career. And they expected him to do practical things like make maps of their territory and design costumes and design fortifications and design pageants and stage sets and things like that as well. And so this is a very good example of something that was commissioned from him by the Florentine government in the summer of 1504 as a practical survey. 
in exactly the same years, the Florentine government also commissioned from Leonardo the biggest painting that he ever worked on in his life, which was a mural, not a fresco, but a mural, of the Battle of Anghiari, um, commemorating the famous uh, victory of the Florentines over the Milanese in the summer of 1440, so about 60 years before. So it's like us uh, commemorating a, uh, a painting of D-Day or something like that. It's about the same, uh, the same distance of, uh, of time. And this was a time when the Florentine government was feeling itself embattled, and so they wanted to paint a patriotic mural celebrating the glorious history of the Florentine government in the council chamber of the Palazzo Vecchio, the main council building in Florence. And it was to be about 70 feet wide and about 15 feet high. So if you can imagine from the, um, from the archway there, probably down to about here, a huge thing. The biggest mural, uh, the biggest project that Leonardo ever worked on. And so he prepared for this meticulously. He made dozens, hundreds of sketches for it. He started to make a, a, a full-scale cartoon, as it's called, to transfer his designs onto the wall of the council chamber. He worked on it for about two years, but he was called away uh, to Milan, sent as a diplomatic gift from the Florentines back to the Milanese government, and work on it was never completed. And about 50 years later, it was painted over by Giorgio Vasari. You may have been aware in the news of somebody claiming that this mural is still there underneath Vasari's frescoes in the council chamber. And they're, they're, they've, they've, they've done like a medical probe behind Vasari's frescoes to see whether Leonardo's mural is still there. And they've found a little bit of pigment about that big. And they've suggested that we destroy Vasari's frescoes just to see whether the Leonardo mural is actually there. I really, really hope they don't do it because they're not going to find anything. But um, uh, that, so that if anybody asks you about that, that that's the story. Uh, this is one of the drawings that Leonardo did in preparation for the Battle of Anghiari, showing the expressions of fury in a horse, a man, and for good measure, a lion. He was interested in comparative anatomy. He wanted to see how the same muscles cause the same expressions in different species, including man, because the central motif of the Battle of Anghiari was to be this furious... Um, skirmish of men and horses biting each other and hacking at each other and so on and Leonardo wanted to make it as, as expressive as possible and this is the sort of drawing he was making for it um, in addition for the same fresco for the same mural sorry he made a survey of the male figure not in the pose of the figures to be painted but yeah, like an architectural survey. So showing men standing in perfect balance with their arms by their sides. And in some of the drawings, they're actually holding on to like um, sort of walking poles so that it's taking the, the tension out of their shoulders. From the back, from the front, from the side, he said that all, while it's important to know what the muscles look like when they're tensed, you also have to know what they look like when they're relaxed. Because if you paint every muscle tensed, you will have produced a sack of nuts rather than a human figure. The equivalent would be um, the cover of a bodybuilding magazine, where it doesn't look expressive, it just looks grotesque. And people like, well, I think he was actually aiming that slightly at Michelangelo, but certainly at people like Signorelli, where everybody is you know, a bit like that, and it just looks a little bit silly. So Leonardo made drawings such as this. And this is the most famous, the most beautiful. It's in... Chalk. Now, I mentioned Metal Point earlier. About 1490-92, Leonardo suddenly discovers chalk, and almost overnight, he abandons Metal Point, this laborious process where you have to prepare the surface of the paper very carefully, and starts to use natural red and black chalks. Now, these are not like pastels today that are fabricated. These are naturally occurring minerals. Red chalk is like a, a hard clay, a, a red clay. Black chalk is a carbonaceous shale. They're naturally occurring. You dig them out of the ground, you can sharpen them, they hold a point, they adhere very well to the surface of the paper. They don't rub off like, char uh, like charcoal does. So it's the perfect drawing medium, and Leonardo uses this um, for preference for the rest of his life. And artists used so much of this, but by the middle of the 18th century, natural supplies of red and black chalk had been pretty much exhausted. And that's when Conte crayon and so on start to be manufactured as substitutes for what was then becoming very 
uh, expensive natural chalks. But this is what you see Leonardo exploiting uh, around 1504. We're halfway through. I'm going to get a little bit quicker towards the end, but any questions at this point about these drawings? Okay, we'll press on. Yeah. So, the horse didn't get made because in 1494, just as Leonardo was on the point of making the casting, though as I said he might have been procrastinating his casting, um, the French invaded Italy and the bronze, the scrap bronze that had been assembled to melt down to make this cast was requisitioned and was sent to Ferrara to be cast into cannon, into defensive cannon. And so the bronze wasn't there. Leonardo was diverted from the equestrian monument to the Last Supper, which was another commission from Ludovica Sforza. Five years later, the French having left, they came back again. This time, they overthrew Ludovica Sforza, and the, the, the full-scale model for the horse was used as target practice by the French archers and destroyed. And Leonardo saw his model destroyed in front of him, so he was never able to, to finish the cast. That's the tragic story of, of Leonardo's equestrian bronze. Yes. They are. They're, they're a memory of Leonardo's project, I think, rather than reflecting one of his actual designs. Um, there's, a, there's going to be an exhibition in Budapest in a couple of years on, on that subject, so um, hopefully we'll be able to talk a bit more about it then. Now this shows you what subtlety red chalk is capable of. This is a branch of blackberry drawn, well, it's one of a number of botanical drawings done by Leonardo when he was working on a painting of Leda and the Swan. Uh, Leda who was seduced by Jupiter in the form of a swan and Leda laid two eggs, rather surprisingly for her. And from these hatched twins, Castor and Pollux and Clytemestra and Helen of Troy. So the subject matter was fertility. And so Leonardo was to surround Leda with plants and flowers, and he made many drawings of plants in connection with that painting. But these were far more detailed than was necessary for um, an incidental detail of a painting. And it seems that Leonardo at this time was becoming interested in botany as a subject in its own right. He came up throughout his life with many different ideas for treatises, for books on scientific subjects. And the growth of plants and flowers and trees seems to have been one of these subjects. So it may have been that a drawing such as this was kind of for a painting, but also for a scientific treatise. And quite a lot of Leonardo's subjects, uh, studies are for that purpose. But you can see um, this drawing, it's about so big. Um, obviously, when it's on screen, it's greatly magnified. It's a small drawing. And when you look at the, uh, the individual bobbles, whatever the technical term is, of these blackberries through a microscope, they hold the detail right down to the finest level. And they show why red chalk was so favored by artists, because you really could sharpen it to a fine point, and it would hold that point and give extremely fine detail on the surface of the paper. And these drawings, although they're for a painting, are more detailed than any, um, any uh, botanical treatise um, and any florilegium that was being executed in Europe at that time. It's on a red prepared ground, which was made by grinding the red chalk to a powder and then rubbing that on the surface of the paper. Leonardo didn't need to do that for any technical reason as he had to for the metal point drawings. I think he was doing this just because he liked the colour. And red on red was a pleasing coloristic effect for him. No technical reason for it. Now, Leonardo cut up 30 bodies during the course of his career. He wanted to write a treatise on anatomy. And of all of his scientific work, his work on anatomy was the most detailed and the area in which he went furthest. Now, a lot of people think that the dissection of human bodies was banned by the church. It wasn't. That came, in fact, it never came. Um, in 1482, Sixtus IV, Pope Sixtus IV, to clear up any confusion, issued a papal bull to say, it's fine to cut up bodies as long as you do it respectfully and you bury the bits together afterwards. So at the resurrection, people have got all their arms and legs and so on. 
And around 1489, Leonardo started cutting up skulls and drawing those. Around 1508 to 1513, he dissected about 30 human corpses, working in monastery hospitals in Florence, working in the medical schools of the University of Pavia, to, um, with the intention of compiling and publishing an illustrated treatise on the human body. And the most um, well-known, the best documented of these dissections was done in the winter of 1508, when he was in Florence. And he wrote in uh, a little notebook, and this is one of the pages from that notebook, that he was in the hospital of Santa Maria Nuova, and he witnessed the death of a hundred-year-old man who claimed to have no discomfort other than a weakness. And he passed away without any sign of any distress, and Leonardo wrote, and I dissected him to see the cause of so sweet a death. And this I found to be a fainting away through lack of blood to the artery which nourishes the heart, which I found very thin and dry and withered. And it's a beautiful description of coronary vascular occlusion. Um, it's what we'd call now, um, sorry, we'd call that coronary vascular occlusion. Leonardo didn't have such words, of course, but he described it very well. And uh, the fact that he was able to perform such a perfect post-mortem, such a very lucid post-mortem, suggests that he had quite a bit of experience of dissection already by this date. And he also goes on to say that because the man was so thin, he and, uh, had no fat which was obscuring the organs, he was able to make a very clear investigation of the organs. And so what we have here are drawings of the heart and the liver and the spleen and the kidneys and the vessels connecting them as Leonardo tried to understand the nature of the cardiovascular system. Just as with the horse, he wasn't able to complete his treatise on anatomy. If he had have done, if he had published this, um, it would have been the most important book on the subject of human anatomy ever to be published, and Leonardo would be remembered as one of the greatest scientists of the Renaissance as well as one of the greatest artists, but for various reasons it was never published, and all the folios remain together at Windsor Castle today. Now this is our poster, sorry, excuse me, <clears throat> I woke you all up, didn't it? This is my poster girl, our poster girl for the exhibition, uh, a study of the head of St. Anne for the painting in the Louvre of the Madonna and Child with St. Anne and a Lamb. It's in black chalk only, on white paper. Um, it shows the great subtlety of modeling that Leonardo is capable of, and he's famous in the Mona Lisa for the great softness, the sfumato of his modeling. And this shows how he developed that sfumato, his smokiness, literally in his preparatory drawing us. Um, a lot of people just stand rather misty-eyed in front of this drawing and say, oh, it's so beautiful. And it really is, I, I can't deny that. He was more concerned with the headdress than with the details of the face. Um, they're very regularized, they're very idealized, but Leonardo was fascinated by extravagant hairstyles and headdresses and so on. And even in a sacred subject such as St. Anne, he was, um, he was, uh, delighted to see what extravagant effects he could capture. This is probably the most charming drawing in the exhibition. It's the one that everybody falls in love with. And if you go to the Kitty Cafe, this is your, uh, this is your model. Um, done from the life, partly. You can see the drawings on the right where Leonardo's clearly drawn an actual cat curled up and sleeping, just as my cat was on the bed as I left this morning. But he was also capable of imagining, in a very concrete way, things that he could never have seen. Now, lions were kept in cages in Italy at that time, so he would have seen lions in Florence and in Rome. But the dragon, at lower centre, I'm guessing he never saw, but he draws it with just as much um, concrete reality as the cat surrounding it. So you've always got to be a little bit careful with Leonardo, whether what he's drawing is something he'd actually seen, or whether he's just imagined it. And this very last drawing, done right at the end of his life, when he was aware of his own body failing, he was aware of his gradually diminishing powers, and he became obsessed, increasingly obsessed, with death and destruction, and a mighty tempest, a huge storm, sweeping away everything on earth. And he wrote long, long passages describing with almost glee how everything on earth, mountains and trees and cities, would all be swept away. And it has its visual equivalent in a series of drawings of a deluge. They're only about so big, only about eight inches across. But in those, this is one of about 12 
drawings of this size. You see this amazing storm descending from the clouds. There's a mountain at the left fragmenting and falling into the flood. The only thing left standing is a tree at lower right and that's about to be swept away. And in the last drawings of the sequence, nothing solid is left at all. It's just a, uh, a, a, a turmoil of water and dust and clouds. Um, he died about a year after this in 1519 uh, and all his papers were left and passed to his favorite pupil. Now, if those drawings had been lost, if they'd gone down in the ship that was carrying them from Spain to Italy in about 1620, we would know so much less about Leonardo. He was almost a mythical figure by the middle of the 19th century. And about, I would say, 80 to 90% of what we know about Leonardo, we know from his drawings and primarily from the drawings of Windsor. And what I've tried to do in this exhibition is to give, in just 10 drawings, as much of an overview as I can of what Leonardo actually did and what we know only through his drawings. Um, so I hope that you get a lot out of these. I hope you can bring as many people as possible. And um, if there's any more questions, I'm happy to take them out.